So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this mic is very sensitive, by the way. So if I get exceedingly loud, just go ahead and raise your hand and be like, yo, dog, quiet. Um, so in any case, uh, first I want to thank all the organizers for PyTexas for inviting me uh, to do a keynote. And I know I've got you trapped until lunch. So um, I will abuse that. Um, so this is my talk, not really. Um, this is just, this is, what you ex this is what you expect when you think about marketing. So believe it or not, I'm actually not in marketing. Uh, I'm the senior manager in charge of the Rackspace Developer Experience Group. Uh, and you can see the URL down there, developer.rackspace.com. I've been involved in the Python community for many moons. I ran PyCon US several years, did a bunch of sponsorship stuff. Um, I'm actually really happy to be here today because this is my people, frankly. It's, I've done a lot of talks at like OSCON and Fluent and other things like that. And frankly, it's really nice to be in a room of mostly friendly faces so that when you see this, um, this little version number there, uh, I don't feel so bad if I screw something up because I know I'm among friends. So we're going to talk about developer experience, marketing. Woo, marketing. I know you're exciting. You're really excited. And right now, marketing, it is the process of communicating the value of a product or service to customers for the purpose of selling that. Right now, this is what you're feeling. Like, oh crap, we've got 50 minutes of this guy. He's going to talk about marketing. This is natural. You've got this really uncomfortable feeling in your gut. And you're like, oh god. Um, this is natural but bear with me. What if we tweak this term just a little bit more and think about it a little bit differently? Process of communicating, okay, good. Product or service to users. Engaging a wider community in the use of something. Okay, we're getting a little bit better. And now you've got that uncomfortable feeling again, which is, hey, listen, we're all programmers. So raise your hand in here if you get paid to program. Raise your hand if you're a student. Interesting, some hands didn't go up. Hmm. All right. Well, let's just say I'm going to assume that all of us are developers to some extent, right? And you, you say, I'm not selling anything. The reality is, is that if you do an open source project, you release code into the wild, you release anything, a blog, a little library, a framework, you are selling something. You're marketing something. What you are doing is this fundamental key of marketing, which is engaging a community in the use and contribution to a creation. You want to build a community. You want to open source things. You want to give back to the community. You want to sell a product or something else like that. You're all kind of part of this without even realizing it. A key thing to remember here and I'm going to go into the media version of this shortly, is if you don't market, if you think that, oh, we don't have to market, you know, I'm just gonna chuck some stuff up into GitHub, everything's gonna be cool. If you don't think about this, if you don't think about your user experience, your developer experience, worse is better. Worse will always beat you. And I've been beaten before, right? Had the best technically sound product on the market, something that was easier with less options, wiped us out. This has happened at companies, this has happened in open source. This happens in open source all the time. Everyone looks at Docker, right? The Docker example is a prime example of, it's not worse. I mean, Linux containers have been around since roughly the dawn of time. Um, I think they're older than I am, right? But they made them easy. So they sucked all of the oxygen out of the room, right? If you can make it easier, you can make it simpler, you will win. So how do we think about this? What's our frame of reference? Well, if you're a bunch of developers in this room, and you are, how do you, how do you think about this? How do you think about this marketing idea that I've kind of put out there? Developer experience, DX. This isn't actually a new industry concept. 
So, Pamela Fox, literally listen, go and watch every talk that she's ever done and follow everything she says. She is amazing. She was part of the Google Developer Relations Group. She defines this as basically the sum of all interactions and events, both positive and negative, between a developer and a library, tool, or API. Right? This is the most concise and clear definition for developer experience I can find. Now, obviously, this overlaps with user experience, and we'll touch on that later. But Pamela has outlined a huge amount of data on this. Most of you are familiar with Kenneth Reads. He made requests and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? His tagline is, for humans. Again, user experience, clean design, right? Marketing. When you go and hit the requests webpage, and I'll show you that in a second, you're being marketed to. You're being marketed to in a way that you understand that it's part of the user experience. And that's important because it makes people want to be part of something and use it. So why do I care? I'm a developer. Even though I'm in management, I'm still a developer, right? I'm a consumer of APIs. I'm a consumer of libraries. I'm a consumer of services. I'm a developer that does open source. Therefore, I'm a producer. Uh, I work for the cloud or a cloud. The cloud? Yeah. I'm a weapons dealer. I sell APIs, right? And I know many of the people in this room probably work at companies that expose an API, you're all weapons dealers. And I'm human, you know? So I care about user experience and developer experience because I have a short attention span. Let's go ride a bike. Um, I don't want things that suck because other people don't want things that suck. So I'm empathetic to what you want because you want to get a job done. So why do you care? Same reasons. Right? If this was a Venn diagram, they'd be floating on top of each other. I really love Venn diagrams. Um, you're a developer, you're a producer, you're a seller. You have a short attention span. Right? We're trying to get a job done. Therefore, if it's not sticky, if it doesn't help me get my job done, or if it's too complex, if I have to like read entire 800-page PDFs on how to get something done, I'm out. And most of us are. You don't want things that suck because it slows you down, it confuses you, and you want to get things done. Fundamentally, a bad developer experience means that people won't promote you. They won't contribute to your open source project. They won't read your readme. They won't view your GitHub. They won't communicate with you on Twitter. Or they'll flame you on Twitter, which really actually sucks, because that's like the worst venue ever to get flamed on. 140 characters, tweet storm, yeah, sweet. Additionally, bad developer experiences mean that as soon as you or I smell something that is even minorly better, right? It could just be tiny. It could be as tiny as sign up or an API reference manual. As soon as we see something slightly better, we're gone. We will adopt it. We have, the, we have very uh, short attention spans as a community, and that's good. So good developer experience means that people are happy to use something. Happy, it's an emotion, right? They feel successful and empowered. They become your advocates. That's what the key here is. You want to have a good developer experience so that pe other people will go and be your advocates because external advocates, people who aren't on your payroll, are infinitely more powerful than you are. So if I'm a developer advocate on the payroll for Rackspace, my voice counts one-tenth of yours if you're not working for me and you're promoting us. Right? This goes for every product on the planet. So, developer experience, sociology, what is it that you want? If you're releasing a library, tool, framework, open source, a product, anything, you want network effects, right? You want people to become your external advocates, talk about you, advocate for you, 
start building things on you, tell other people about you, answer questions for you on Stack Overflow. This helps build an ecosystem of things built on the thing that you have shipped. So if it's an API, it's people talking about the Twilio API. Look at this awesome thing that I built, right? You start seeing an ecosystem of other applications built on your fundamental building block. The same thing goes for open source libraries. Ecosystems drive innovative usage. What does innovative usage mean? How many people here have heard of the Netflix Chaos Monkey system? All right, so a few of you. So Chaos Monkey is this really awesome Netflix testing tool that goes through your distributed system and starts wiping out the nodes out from underneath it. It's sort of, it, it, it wasn't new to those of us who had done distributed systems in the past, but all of a sudden you have an open source package that does this entire QE uh, system for you about wiping out nodes within your distributed system. Right, so you can test fault tolerance, data replication, you know, mean time between failure issues, et cetera. That's innovative usage, right? That's somebody building on an ecosystem to build something that's innovative and useful for a whole swath of developers and communities across the world. This is what you want. When you start building this, even with your tiny open source project, even the smallest HTTP library, when you get the cycle going, you can take a step back, right? You no longer are married to it for the rest of your life. At least I hope not. Fundamentally, where do you hit developers? Where do you hit them with developer experience? You hit them in the fields, right? So what does it look like? What does a good developer experience look like? And this is where I kind of cross the boundaries between, hey, listen, maybe this doesn't apply to an open source project, maybe it applies to a business. Fundamentally, if you're in the market, you can ignore some of this, but for the most part, look at it holistically. Especially if you ever think about going to Silicon Valley and making the big bucks. Answer all of these questions right now about your application, about your library, about your framework. You can't, I can't. I mean, I'm not even gonna read them all. I mean, that's a, that's a lot. But the idea here is that you have to streamline all of these to make everything awesome, right? This is basically user experience crossed with developer experience, right? How do I contribute, right? That little thing right there, that's a little open source thing, right? That you're not gonna see that in typical UX. So let's get started. Do I want to use it? This is the first question you have to answer for a developer. First answer to that is, what does it do? When I hit your web page, I want to know immediately what it does. And I've got a lot of good friends who work for both of these projects, so I'm not just picking on them. Um, but IPython, I love IPython. It is probably one of the best tools I've ever used in my life. But I hit the web page and I'm like, but what is it? What does it do? Um, and then pylons, right? Or pyramid and pylons. It's like, I, I know it's a web framework because I've been in the Python community for almost a decade now. But what does it do? What is it? Right? The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> you, you, it, it's, like, it's like, what does it do? What is it? Um, Here's some good examples. And I have to hand it to the JavaScript community and I think this is kind of an outshoot of the Ruby community trend. They're really good at marketing, right? Node, you hit the web page, and it's like fast scalable network applications. Boom, mic drop, walk out, right? You know exactly once you hit that page, you know what it does and you know if it's right for you. Down here, Jekyll, a Ruby thing. Or I, I use Jekyll a lot, so I actually know what it is. It's not a thing. But what does it do? It transforms your plain text into static websites and blogs. I know exactly what it does. I answer that question. That's a great developer experience. I know I can hit the page and answer the question that I have within 30 seconds, five seconds actually, depending on my internet connection. I have TWC, so it kind of sucks. Um, so, does it have the features I need, right? So as a developer, we have to know, does it have the features, right? So this is a mail gun, 
right? I love it because I hit the home page and I can say, look at that Python example. I'm sending email. I'm sending a simple message. I can see that right on the home page. I can see it in the language of my choice. Boom, I know. Most of all, I see a prominent link to the documentation, which will Im immediately sends a good signal to me saying they thought about this, right? I can click into that, and on the left, you'll actually see the Mailgun docs, right? I click into it, API reference, boom, I can see everything that it does. Well, within reason, right? This can answer within 10 seconds of hitting the website, right? So now we're hit the website, we've done our first evaluation, second evaluation. I can look at the documentation and does it do what I need it to do to be successful? Over here, so yeah, API reference, programming language of my choice, requests. Click on the documentation, or even scroll down. I can see what does the requests Python library do, right? Holy, like it does SSL cert verification. I'm in, right? I think it's the only Python library that does. Um, not that I'm being bitter. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it's like, does it have the features I need? You have to answer this immediately. Are other people or companies using it? Now this is an interesting one and one that often gets forgotten inside of open source, right? So I see a use case, distributed applications composition. That is a use case that sounds really wordy and very long, but to a great segment of the market, I now know that if I'm building on Docker, and so this is the Docker site, I know I can fulfill that use case because somebody else is, right? Rackspace, we use it for continuous integration. Again, another use case. It gives you the user or the developer hitting your site validity that it is stable, that other people rely off of it, that people are putting in production. Rackspace. Are other people or companies using it? So if you've got an open source project, raise up. It's not sufficient just to go to GitHub and be like, yeah, check out all these forks, right? So I have 500 forks to my open source project. Doesn't mean a lot. You know, make a site, you know, show some care in the craft that raises up your top contributors, right? Make it almost like a leaderboard. Show off popular repositories, things like that. This all matters to developers when they're evaluating something, whether or not we admit it, right? We look for these social cues on every site for every library that we look, uh, that we look at and evaluate every day. This doesn't apply so much for those of you just building libraries, but for those of us in the weapons dealing business, um, how do I sign up? Developers hate signups. Raise your hand if you love going through complex signups. That's what I thought. Um, so, this one isn't awesome, right? It's basically you hit the page, you click sign up, and it's basically saying, hey, listen, before I even know your name, let's get married. <laughs> right? It's like, oh, that's awkward. This is much better. This is mail guns, right? It tells you up at the top, 57 seconds. That's how long it will take you to sign up. You don't have to put any billing stuff in there. You know, you use a little laser pointer. No billing. Boom. And then I have to do a recapture, which I always fail. So I always assume I'm a spammer. Um, this is much better. But still, let's look at the holy grail. Simple cloud hosting built for developers. Just enter your email address and a password and you create an account. Boom, mic drop, walk away, you're done, right? <laughs> this is the great thing about developer experience and user experience to a certain point. You can pull tricks, right? So with this, you still have to fill out everything here and here. But they've delayed it. They give you the instant gratification of thinking you've created an account so you can immediately get started, right? That 55 seconds doesn't include entering your billing information and everything else like that, right? But for developers, we have short attention spans. Not all of us, I do. Um, I also have two kids, it makes it worse, so, so yeah. 
It's trickery of the best kind. It helps us when we go here and we sign up, we feel like we're off to the races. Zero to 50, three seconds, we're done. It empowers us. Next question, how do I get started? So, Heroku does this amazingly well. They have binaries for their tool belt for every platform. Raise your hand if you are a Windows user in here. Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, Windows is still a thing. It is very important and it's still the majority of the market. So if you're building a Python library, build wheel files that install easily on Windows, please. Right? I don't use Windows personally, but hey, you can't ignore a mass portion of the market. Build binary packages, cross compile. OS X, Windows, Linux, these are your targets, have binaries for them. Make it dirt simple. Don't make them install a compiler to get to your thing, which is like my pet peeve. And I am also guilty of performing this sin, so I'm, I'm in a glass house. Support all of the languages, right? If you have the bandwidth or if your community has built it for you, like if you're selling an API or somebody else has built something on it, raise them up, right? Support all the languages. Ruby, uh, curl's not a language. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm good. Uh, so Ruby, Python, PHP, Java, C Sharp, Go, right? Get all of the languages in there. Get as many programming languages in there if you're selling an API because guess what? If somebody sees, even if they're bad code examples, and I tr trust me, most, of, most code examples out there on the internet are bad, um, but that's because I'm a snob. Um, even if they're bad, it helps you as a developer feel empowered. So how do you think other developers want to feel? They want to feel like they can get started fast, now, immediately. They're going to copy and paste whatever you put in there, by the way. <laughs> so if it's got code errors, don't do that. All the languages, again, Heroku. They, they got Scala and Clojure. Like, who uses those? I mean, seriously. But look at it. I can go here and be like, I can be successful. I can deploy an application on Heroku using these languages instantly. Node.js. Is that a language or is it a platform? I don't know. So next question, the hello world example. Pamela Fox talks about this a lot, which is she says a lot of programmers kind of do this whenever you say hello world. In reality, there's a reason why hello world is the least common denominator because people can do it instantly. Look at this for Flask, right? I, I can go to the web page, I can look at this and say, I can deploy, I can build this application in 30 seconds. I am empowered, I am going fast, I can get this done. When you're building a library or a tool or a framework or an API, this is probably going to be one of your biggest sells. Because this shows a developer, like there are plenty of things out there like Stripe. Their stuff, it's like, you can start accepting payments in like um, 60 seconds. It's like, sweet, I'll take some of that crack. Jekyll, right? Now again, this is one of those little white lies. This is never that easy. Never. Um, if you've ever dealt with RVM or anything else like that, it's sort of flat. Uh, I'm not going to go into it. It's really sad, actually. But anyways, uh, it, it gets up, get up and running in seconds. But again, if you're a developer and you're hitting this page, think about this, right? You, you're, you're going to be saying, I can go, I, I'm going to hit the gas pedal on my Tesla, and then I'm going to literally go around the sun, go back in time, and save Spock, right? <laughs> like, we're gone. Next question. How do I use it? This is where I'm going to start kind of going off the rails a little bit because this is a little bit ranty here and there. Documentation. I love documentation. I'm very passionate about documentation. And for those coworkers sitting in the room, you know that this is a bugbear of mine. This is where I took all of the images and said, no, focus on this. 
right? Oh, holy moly. So think about this for a second. I'm going a little fast, so I'm going to slow down. Documentation. This is the number one failing of most open source corporate products. Just almost everyone gets their documentation wrong in some way. And it makes me sad because this documentation is the vanguard, right? After everyone has figured out, does it have the features I need? Can I get started? Can I sign up? Can I buy it? Documentation is literally what people are going to go to 99.9% .9 of the time, right? So getting it right matters. And this is where you're going to show your dedication to your craft the most. Every method, perimeter, return value, everything, side effects, deprecation notes must be documented, especially for API and reference guides. If it's deprecated, like big, bold red, and I've got an example on the next page. Input and output correctness trumps example and curl usage, right? If you say, I expect JSON, and it looks like this, that better be correct, because somebody is going to copy and paste that in, right? And when the output doesn't match, they're gonna be like, what, right? And you need API guides and narrative guides, or I will find you. Right? It's not sufficient to have an API guide. Right? If you, it, I know I've got a lot of friends who are Java developers, and I know they love Javadoc, and I know a lot of people think that just like doing basic API guides are really awesome. If you don't have a good narrative guide, you just cut off, you know, several of your own limbs. Right? Because a lot of us, will like to walk through that and learn. Like, I don't know how many times I've read the, the, uh, the Go narrative guide, right? I don't go and like read like the, uh, the language spec or anything else like that. I go in and read, it's like, how do I build my basic quick start Go application? And I've read it like 40 times and I've never actually done it. Um, because I typically read it on a plane. It's good sleeping material. Um, <laughs> good documentation is empathetic. Thick. List known bugs. If you're a product, a service provider, don't be afraid to show your bugs, right? I know somebody in legal is probably like, no, you can't say that doesn't work, right? Ignore them, do the right thing. Because what's going to piss people off more, especially developers, is if you don't document it, they run into it. They will flame you and they will discard you. So. Document your bugs. Have empathy for your users. If you are in doubt, if, you, if there's ever a question in your mind as to whether or not you should document something, document it, right? Even if it's the most bizarre edge case on the planet, sooner or later somebody's gonna Google it or post it on Stack Overflow. Really great documentation, if you can, includes runnable code API explorers or any something else like that because that way they don't have to install anything to know whether or not they can learn it, right? I think uh, python.org, one of my last things that I was involved in in the PSF, we, one of the great things now is if you go to python.org, there's a, a gigantic, you know, start a Python terminal now. You can get started. Go has one too. Many languages now have these interactive online interpreters. This is incredibly powerful because I can just sit there in the browser and see if I even understand the basics of what's going on, and it's amazing. Do it for your libraries. Include helpful error messages, right? Document them. If there's an error message, document it. If there's a possibility that an error message may or may not at one point pass this user by, document it. Uh, because they will go and Google for it when eventually it comes back from your API. Again, if there are known bugs, document them, please. Link to the GitHub issue tracker. Maybe you'll get a patch, right? And I've seen that actually happen. This is a great example. Cryptography.io this is written by a bunch of friends of mine. Um, they have written 
probably one of the best crypto libraries for Python that I've ever seen, right? I do not understand 99.9999999% of what they talk about, right? But I can tell you their documentation is exemplar, their installation is exemplar. Most of all, don't do that. Great big red block. In other words, these are crypto primitives. If you use these, this is equivalent of smoking crack while riding a Harley and going down the highway, right? You will get hurt. But they put it in their documentation. And this sets, a, this sets user expectations. Don't surprise your users. Great documentation is interactive. Have comments enabled. Have a feedback form. Make it easy to file a bug against your documentation or your code, right? Make it easy to engage the product owner. If I file a bug against requests, I know Kenneth will probably see it sooner or later, but I know other core maintainers will see it. Same with Python, right? Product owner contacts, basically people who can make those calls are the most critical thing because that will help drive the engagement. People will feel empowered to help you. So here's an example. When you're in the mailgun documentation, upper right hand corner there's an edit link, right? Guess where that edit link takes you? Boom, GitHub. You can see it's all in Sphinx. You can do the RST, you can do a pull request, fix their docs form, right? So if you find a bug, or if another developer inside of, like Mailgun is part of Rackspace, we're a 6,000 person company. It is literally impossible for us to find the one person who may or may not know something about a mail API, right? So even for your internal people, make it easy for them to go and do this. Lower the barrier to entry and document everything. Good documentation, it's 2014. We're all marketing against each other, right? If you have a HTTP library better than requests, you got a lot of marketing to do, sorry. Make, an, make a developer experience better than Kenneth's, you will succeed, right? But it has to be SEO optimized. And I know SEO is a dirty word. Really, this is shorthand for document everything, link it everywhere, and um, yeah, follow Google's rules so you don't get banned. Um, make it control F efficient. Programmers like to use the keyboard, right? They don't wanna have to go up to a custom search box. You should have a custom search box, but make it so they can just hit control F, find, make it Googleable. Web friendly, digital delivery is now the norm. The dead tree book but online concept is out of date. I actually went to a competitor, I'm not gonna name them, uh, and I said I want to find some documentation and I ended up downloading a 32 megabyte PDF. No digital delivery, well, PDFs, eh, they're kind of digital, but really I just wanted to answer a question. Having me download a 32, 35 megabyte PDF, eh, not on hotel Wi-Fi too, because this is totally last night. And with digital delivery comes constant iteration. We've, hear, we've heard CI, CD for all of our applications. Like I said, I've gone completely off the rails here. Um, CI, CD for your documentation is just as important. When you ship new code, new docs should ship. When you ship new docs, it should just go out. One minute, just boom. So, the next question you have to answer. Do I enjoy using it? What's my time? 39 minutes, good. He said I could run long, so. <laughs> Do I enjoy using it? Look at this, on the requests webpage, look at these endorsements. I'm going to get the request module tattooed on my body, right? I don't even know who Matt is and I'm excited. <laughs> I'm like, I wanna go get a requests tattoo. Actually, I wanna get like Kenneth's head on my back with like requests code all around it, it'd be really actually funny. Um, actually, it'd be wicked creepy. Um, <laughs> but look, look at this, do I enjoy using it? Answer this question, have quotes, right? Answer the question for developers who are coming in to use your thing. Because when you and I read things like this, I get excited, I'm like, sweet, Daniel Greenfield, he could remove 1200 lines of code, lock, spaghetti code from a library with 10 lines of code. 
right? That's empowering. That tells uh, that's social signals. That's great developer experience. But most of all, if you want to make things enjoyable for other developers, keep the API clean. You know, look at requests, look at everything else, look at Flask, look at these very clean, small, like when you install them and when you get started, there's a very small window that you actually interact with. It's only when you start going off kind of like the rails and the beaten path that you see how powerful they are. But keep the initial API and the initial experience small. Less is more. Right? Keep it simple. Keep it clean. Again, this is why Docker is such a raging success. It makes the easy things easy and the hard things easy, too. Only expose more to your public-facing API when users ask. And then only when it doesn't violate the sim fundamental simplicity. So if I've got requests, right, and I'm maintaining the module, I'm probably going to get a request on the basic HTTP object that I want you to, God, what's the craziest HTTP? I want you to do multi-form form posts by default, right? Or I want to have a method that when I do a git on a page, I want to be able to call, f you know, multi-part form post on the object that I get back. Something really bizarre like that. I'd say no to that. Like, I'll give you the ability to do what you want, but I'm not going to put it in the top level API because that makes it worse for everybody else. <sighs> Another thing, do I enjoy using it? Don't invent your own standards. If there's an API out there that you can copy, copy it. If there's a sign up out there, copy it. If there's a look and feel out there that very much matches what you're trying to do, don't be a jerk. Don't completely, don't like literally control S, save it. Um, but you get what I'm saying, right? Don't roll your own. Everybody else has been doing this a lot longer than I have, right? Learn from the best. And don't make your own data interchange format, please. Like, use JSON, XML. I hate XML, but God, don't, don't roll your own. Like, I know Google thinks that they're awesome and they release protocol buffers and everything else like that, and I'm sure it's wicked fast. Just, just don't. Like, that's, like, you must be this tall to ride the ride. And it's awful. They must have their problems. Protocol buff is very specialized. Yeah. No, it's, it's, if I'm searching for data interchange formats, it's going to pop up, right? So, like, this is super fast and this does this thing. It's like all of a sudden you realize it's like I've got to have Google level problems, right? But in order to even understand that point that I've got to have Google level problems, I've got to be like that tall, right? And I've got a seven year old and that's disappointing, right? I walk up to the ride at like six parks and I'm like, boom, uh, no, she's 21. She's just got a condition, <laughs> right? Debugging. Ah. Uh. Error 129, an error. What the is that? <laughs> Seriously. Python has, yeah. It's something. It's like God only knows what it is. And it's like, especially if you're building a REST API, we're all guilty of this. And it's terrible developer experience. It's like, we'll make HTTP error codes do random shit. It is awesome. It's like error 401. Well, 401 actually means something via some RFC, some guy wrote, right? It's like, eh, it means something, but I'm gonna make it mean that you couldn't properly shard the object against multiple data centers. That's cool, man. Um, no, make useful error messages. Not, don't just follow standards, especially if you're building an HTTP API but also make the error messages make sense. Error and error, I've actually seen this come out of APIs and libraries. I've seen it come out of C Python, right? It's like an error happened, or segfault, or my favorite, exit one. When you're auditing a code base and you see sys.exit one, you're like, what does, I know that Unix, if it exits non-zero, that means that a problem, but print something. Like, come on, throw me a bone here, right? Make it debuggable. 
especially when you're like, we're in the age of JavaScript where everything is like hyper compressed and like literally the rigor is to remove all of the white space and characters from it and you know, make A variables and B variables and all this other stuff. It's like, please God, make your error messages sane. So the next question you have to ask for a great developer experience, how do I get help? I really like this. <laughs> um, forums, if they don't suck. Forums become just, uh, right? If you can, just use Stack Overflow, and even then, that's kind of meh. Um, but discourse doesn't suck, actually. Like, don't worry about PHBB or some other thing you've got to pay like $400 a month for. Just go and find a forum that's got like badging and all the other neat good stuff that everyone and upvoting like social icons and everything else like that. Just set it up. Give your users some place to actually help each other. And also it's really good for asynchronous thing and it's also really good for SEO. Because the other thing is, is that not only are the users helping each other, but Google sees all. It's like Mordor, right? It's just like, <laughs> right? If somebody goes to Google, instead of me finding my own blog post talking about Python threading, Instead, I'll find an answer here. I'm like, boom, there we go. Somebody else figured that problem out. I don't have to like recurse into my own blog post. Asynchronous communication, it's like we're programmers, come on. Like how many of us operate in real time? Mm -hmm. um, email, mailing lists. Prepare for that one dude um, who is going to argue about the names of random functions and everything else like that. That is called the bike shed. I'm not gonna go into it, just prepare for it. It's the world, welcome. Uh, this actually happens with, um, if you're a weapons dealer, if you're selling APIs, this happens too. It's like, well, why, didn't, why did you do a put versus a post? Or why, didn't, why did you call it this versus that? Um, it just happens. Forums, see previous. Bug trackers. If you don't have a bug tracker and it's 2014, go home. <laughs> Just go home. If you sell something and you don't have a bug tracker, if you sell something to developers and you don't have a bug tracker, go home. You're done, right? And Twitter. Get on Twitter. I know, social media, blah, blah, blah. but guess what? People go there and bitch all of the time. And sometimes, you can actually make the best promoters by just engaging them in a small conversation and say, hey, listen, I know you had a problem. I feel you, let me help you. And I've seen that work out more often than not. Very typically, because I'm the guy saying, oh, God, I know you're angry, it's totally cool, dude. I'll help you. Customer service actually matters. And now to the close, how do I contribute? How do I help you consume the rainbow? Um, especially in open source or even anything that involves like client libraries or anything else like that answer, how do I actually contribute, right? Make it easy, right? It must be publicly accessible and anyone should be empowered to make a pull request. I know that's a GitHub term, but just make it simple don't have like a 32 page manual. And this is the big thing that CPython has always had that we've been working on for years, right? You gotta get a bug tracker login, then you have to learn patch, and then you've gotta upload the patch, and then it has to be reviewed in Retveld and all this other stuff, right? That workflow sucks. Make it easy for people to contribute and they will get engaged with you more, right? The faster someone can contribute, the more engaged and invested they will be and the more network effects, the more ecosystem you'll have. No one should have to learn enterprise tooling or changes in your weirdo workflow, right? And trust me, in open source, we got some weirdo workflows because literally it was like made in like 1970 and no one ever changed it. Um, oddly enough, some companies today that ship APIs were also made in 1970 and they still haven't updated. But with contribution, an important thing here, assume positive intent. If you're building something and you're publishing it out there and somebody yells at you on Twitter or something else like that, guess what? It means that they care. They care enough 
even if they're delivering it in the most toxic way possible, which is, right? They care enough to say something. It's the people who don't say something that you have to worry about, the people who just check out, right? So assume positive intent until proven otherwise, right? Assume the guy who just submits the random patch that just cusses you out and everything else like that. Assume he's trying, just got really bad communication skills, or he was up way too late trying to solve a problem, right? Be empathetic. So what is developer experience? What is everything that I've talked about? It involves the developer's behaviors, attitudes, emotions about using a thingy, which is actually a technical industry term, copyright, all rights reserved. It's about making them feel like a boss, right? The best developer experience empowers a developer. It makes them feel like they are the smartest person in the room. Right? It makes them think that they can get s successful. Like, even if I know that deep down inside I'm going to step into this thing and it's super easy and I feel empowered and I'm just going to go and tear it, like, go, super simple. I'm just going to build this awesome network service or node.js, right? I, deep down inside I know in like a year I'm totally going to regret that decision in 32 ounces of like local beer I drink. Um, I'm going to regret that decision later on but I feel empowered. I'm going to be engaged with your product or your library. Make them feel like a boss and you will win. So I'm going to read. DeveloperEvangelism.com, Pamela Fox literally wrote a book. It's awesome. Go do everything that Pamela says. Think about this, right? Kenneth, right? Kenneth, <laughs> again, he made Python or HTTP for humans, and he keeps doing the humans thing. And then other people started copying the humans thing, so I think humans are dead. <laughs> We've got to find a new, ooh. That was probably the wrong way of saying that. Um, but Kenneth Reitz does a huge amount of trying to make things simple, beautiful, and clean. He does a lot of talks. Eden Gazet, right? He works at Heroku. They just released the DX platform, and you can tell he believes in the craft about empowering and engaging developers. These are people who are much smarter than me in this area. I'm just going to go and do what they say because I have limited time. Or at least that's my excuse. So with that, let me check the time. Oh, we're right about on time. Do we have five minutes for questions? All right. So ask me anything. It doesn't have to be related to this talk. It can literally be, you know, what did I have for breakfast, which actually isn't that interesting. So raise your hand. Shoot. What's a good way to, suppose you uh, are arguing with somebody on a, with in a project about, you know, we should do this because of the developer experience. What are good ways to win that conversation? So the question is, is how to win an argument when it's a matter of you're arguing for the developer experience and the other person doesn't necessarily agree. Data, show them, do a survey. Like go send out something to Twitter and simply say, hey listen, do you prefer A or B, Coke or Pepsi? Uh, do a test, right? Very typically developers and even managers are swayed by data, right? And also show them prior art, right? Don't say we're going to copy it flagrantly, but show them prior art and prior data. Any other questions? Well, I killed y'all, so I think we've got a lunch announcement. Yeah. So thank you very much.